All right, the numbers seem to be slowing down a bit. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. So again, welcome everyone. We are so happy to have you here with us today for this webinar about practical experience opportunities that you can take advantage of during your studies here at Lund, ways to really enhance your studies outside of the actual classroom, uh, such as study abroad, internships, research, part-time jobs, and the like. So we're going to really dive deep into all these different opportunities here today. And we have a great panel here for you of current students who are currently taking advantage of some of these different options uh, to enhance their studies. Uh, so before we introduce ourselves, I want to give a few little logistical notes, first of all, for our session today. Uh, so first of all, in the Q&A, you'll find at the bottom of the screen, you can post any questions you have for our students about their experiences uh, doing these different opportunities. And that's where we'll be taking the questions from, which is, of course, our main reason to be here today to answer those questions for you. If you find that someone has already posted the same question that you have, you can use the little thumbs up feature to upvote that question, and that will send it to the top of the list to make sure that we're able to answer that question, since it's, of course, something that a lot of people are wondering about. And because we are here today with current students, we are going to focus uh, all of our time and all of our questions today on their experiences, on these different opportunities that they've taken advantage of and the student experience. So if you have questions about applications or scholarships or other matters like that, it's better for you to join one of our upcoming sessions tomorrow where we're going to go really in depth about the application process and all of those matters where you can hear more from the recruitment staff. Uh, so I'll give you some links at the end of the session today where you can sign up for that webinar as well as contact our office but today we're going to really try to manage our time uh, specifically just for our questions for our students here. Now, uh, to begin as well, I'm going to share a brief presentation about the different opportunities that we have to give us a little overview of what's available, but we're going to spend the majority of our time, of course, talking to our students. So to uh, have a quick round of introductions, and actually I realize now I didn't introduce myself. So my name is Audrey Savage, and I'm an international communications officer here at Lund University, working in the International Marketing and Recruitment Office. I'll be moderating the panel today. But before we jump into the presentation, I wanna have a brief introduction round from our panelists. So if everyone could just share your name, where you're from, what you're studying, and what kind of opportunity you're going to be sharing with us today. So we'll start uh, with Saskia. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Saskia. Uh, I'm, I come from Indonesia, and I will be sharing mostly about um, internships. And I'm studying biotechnology. Great. Prince? Hello. Um, my name is Prince, and I'm studying the master's program in public health. And I'll be sharing with you research, which was also my intention. <laughs> Excellent. Alexandra? Hi, my name is Alexandra. I'm from Ukraine. I'm in my second year of international development and management program in Lund. And today I'll share my experience of uh, internships and hopefully a bit about part time jobs. Great. How? Um, so yeah, my name is Powell. I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I study a bachelor's in economy and society, and I'll share you about my experiences studying abroad as an exchange semester. Great. And last but not least, Jana. Hi, I'm Jana. I'm from Germany, and um, I study in my second year of the master program Aquatic Ecology, which is a master within biology. And I will be sharing a bit about doing research within the studies. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. So uh, we'll come back to our panel here in just a few moments after the presentation and learn a lot more in depth about the different experiences they're having. But first of all, I want to start us off with a brief presentation about the different ways that you can get involved here at Lund. So hopefully everyone can see that here and we're going to jump right in. So one of the first questions that we always get from students uh, when talking about different things that you can do outside of your studies is, of course, about working. And a lot of the different opportunities that we have here today, particularly in terms of internships and things, can be funded uh, or cannot be. But there are, of course, uh, opportunities for part time jobs. So one thing that we always like to start off with when we uh, talk about these kind of things is the fact that, first of all, you are, of course, eligible to work part time when you study here at Lund, uh, no matter whether you're an EU citizen or a non EU citizen. 
medicine. However, it's really important to keep in mind the following details. So first of all, if you're a non-EU citizen, you will be required to have some funds to cover your living costs in order to get a residence permit before you come. So we always encourage students to have an idea of kind of what funding options you'll have before uh, applying and before deciding to come, because it's not realistic that you will be able to find a part-time job that will fully cover your living expenses. Of course, EU students don't have a requirement to prove their funding ahead of time, but of course, it is always uh, advisable to still have an idea of kind of what your funding situation will be like. Uh, but part-time jobs can be a really great way to uh, gain kind of some extra living costs on top uh, of your daily expenses, and of course, gain a lot of practical experience uh, that can be useful for going on to a future career. But it's not realistic that it will cover your full living costs. So that's just always something uh, to keep in mind. Also to keep in mind that your studies are, of course, the number one reason why uh, you embark on a degree program. So that's always the number one priority. And studies are typically for around 40 hours per week, uh, which means that you don't necessarily uh, always have time for quite a lot of heavy uh, work on the side. We are a small town in Lund, which means that there are quite a lot of students who are interested in part-time work uh, and not necessarily always as many jobs as there are students. And knowing Swedish is always quite beneficial in the job hunt. So if you don't know Swedish, you can be a little bit uh, behind the rest of the team uh, in terms of, uh, or the rest of the crowd in terms of being able to find a part-time job. Uh, and there aren't as many kind of part-time jobs within the university as there are in other countries. So these are sort of the caveats that we always give towards working while studying. That being said, there are many, many students, uh, international students who do find part-time work, including some of the ones we have on the panel here today. So we will uh, talk about that more extensively in the panel. However, in addition to sort of a traditional kind of part-time job, there are a lot of other ways to gain hands-on experience uh, during your studies, which is a lot of uh, the reason why we're here to share today. So to talk a little bit about each of those in turn, of course, one of the first things that comes to mind when you think of gaining experience uh, outside of the classroom, kind of to build up your, your network or also build up your career experience is an internship. And actually, quite a few of our programs offer uh, the option either as a required part of the program to take an internship. So uh, typically, there's in most programs a semester where you either have an option to do an internship or do an elective course. So you can choose kind of which one best fits your future career outcomes. Uh, and it can be an internship most of the time. Uh, anywhere in the world uh, in terms of your studies. There are, of course, a lot of really great opportunities here in our local area in Skåne, but many programs will allow you to do your internship in other parts of Sweden or in other parts of Europe, for example, or even back in your home country. Uh, there are many students who uh, choose to do internships either on the side of their studies or perhaps in the summer as well, if that's not formally a part of your program. And internships can be typically paid or unpaid. It really depends a lot on what you're applying for and what you're able to look for. So that can, of course, be a great way to enhance your studies. Another thing that really comes top of the mind when you think about uh, additional opportunities outside of studies is, of course, research. So many of our faculties and departments offer the option to engage in research, both as part of your program and also outside of your program. Uh, one of the really notable examples of this is the Faculty of Medicine's Summer Research Scholarship, which actually fully funds two months of research in the summer. And I believe uh, Prince, one of our panelists today, actually has taken part in this. So we'll get to hear more closely about this as part of the panel as well. Uh, but there's a a lot of different opportunities around depending on the department. So we always recommend that you talk first and foremost to your program coordinator and your professors to learn what kind of opportunities are available out there. And we'll hear more from our panelists in a moment about how they found their research opportunities, for example. And of course, uh, many students don't necessarily always think about studying abroad because a lot of our, our well, really most of our students uh, that we speak with here in the international office are, of course, international students. So you're already studying abroad by coming to Sweden, but you can really add even more uh, internationalization to your experience by doing an exchange semester or even a shorter uh, exchange to study in one of our 650 partner universities that are spread all around the world. So most programs uh, that have a internship or a workplace as I mentioned, we'll let you go abroad to do that, but many programs also do have specific connections to different partner universities to allow you to do an exchange program if you would like to do an exchange semester, uh, particularly for our bachelor's degrees, since bachelor's programs are here for three years, so you have perhaps a little bit more time. 
But for some of our shorter programs, for example, business programs that could be only one year, many of them offer an international master's class, which is essentially an extra semester in the summer that you get to do after you finish your degree in order to go to a partner university and have essentially an extra semester, an extra uh, additional certification attached to your degree. Or there are also several double degree options where you can essentially get a degree from two different universities after doing an exchange or a year in that other university. And studying abroad, of course, has so many benefits. It allows you to really enhance your international experience, something you're already getting by studying abroad at Lund, but something that can really help you gain new perspectives and add a lot of different skills to your CV as well. Additionally, most of our programs, if not pretty much all of them at Lund, uh, require students to complete a thesis or a degree project of some sort uh, during their studies at Lund. And this can be really kind of a... a almost somewhat too obvious, but also uh, sneaky, not so obvious way to enhance your studies in order to collaborate potentially with a company or a different organization in order to complete this project. So there are many companies and organizations who actually sponsor students uh, and can quite often pay students to complete their thesis project on a topic that's relevant to that country, to that, sorry, to that company, uh, which can, of course, uh, in many cases, lead to potentially uh, an internship or a job after your studies if the work has been really useful to them and it gives you another way to network with different companies and opportunities as well as of course since most research most theses and degree projects are uh, research based you will be gaining extra experience in terms of research there as well uh, which can be really useful and finally, I think kind of the uh, somewhat overlooked uh, aspect sometimes, but can really still be equally essential in terms of building skills for your CV is of course volunteering. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to volunteer both within student life at Lund in terms of uh, the student organizations and unions and nations, uh, but as well as a lot of local NGOs and organizations uh, that can really help you gain a lot of soft skills, a lot of communication and responsibility, organizational skills, and still be really beneficial for your CV in terms of kind of showcasing your different abilities in these areas, while also letting you make friends, make new connections, and you never really know who you're going to meet at the same time as doing some of these activities. So, of course, a lot of the uh, benefits of doing one of these practical experience opportunities is, of course, that in the moment, it's a very fun and fulfilling thing to do. It's, of course, wonderful to study abroad for a semester or to take part in research and really have the fulfillment of adding to new knowledge. But there is always, of course, the aspect of the fact that it will go on your CV and help you find work after your studies. So just uh, to briefly talk about some of the opportunities for finding work, uh, a degree from Lund is considered highly valuable around the world as we are in one of the top 100 universities ranked in the global employability ranking. Uh, so just in general, even if you study and don't do anything else on the side, uh, you will graduate with a very high level of employability and a degree that really means a lot around the world. But of course, why stop there? Why not add to it with these different experiences? Uh, so you should really take advantage of all the opportunities you have, all the different kinds of things that we're going to talk to about today, but also just all of the classmates and people that you'll meet here at Lund in order to build that international network because you never know who is going to move where and have what job in the future and when that could really benefit you going forward into your uh, work for look for search for work excuse me and after graduation we do have a lot of students uh, who do want to stay in Sweden and I'm going to talk about that briefly for a moment as well and that is something that's very possible and something that many of our students do but since we are uh, a degree from Lund is so highly valuable around the world we always recommend as well that you look for opportunities globally because there can be a lot of options in other countries either nearby in the other Nordics in your home country or elsewhere that could be really interesting as well. And there are also a lot of Swedish companies that are operating abroad, as Sweden, for example, has uh, one of the highest level or the highest rate of unicorns around the world. So unicorns being startups that are valued at over a billion dollars without uh, when being publicly traded um, or sorry, without being publicly traded uh, outside of Silicon Valley. Uh, so there are a lot of different Swedish companies operating around the world where you could potentially make some network connections while you're here in Sweden, but actually go and work in one of their local offices, either in your home country or another country. 
So if you do prefer to stay and work in Sweden after your studies, uh, there is a residence permit for non-EU citizens uh, who to allow you to stay uh, after, for 12 months after your studies in order to look for work after you've graduated, as long as you're able to fund yourself during that time. Uh, EU citizens, of course, are allowed to move freely within the EU, including Sweden, to stay and look for work after studies. So our main uh, tip that we have for staying to look for work is always to kind of start that search and start that networking early on during your studies. And that's something I'm especially eager to hear more in a moment uh, from our panel about, uh, because the network can really help you a lot in finding uh, work within Sweden. And another tip that we have is that, that of course, Students always wonder about if you need to speak Swedish in order to live and study in Sweden, and the answer is definitely not. Everyone does speak English. However, if you, however, if you are hoping to stay and look for work, you definitely won't hurt your chances by learning Swedish because there are a lot of uh, English-speaking companies operating in Sweden, but of course there are many, many more Swedish-speaking countries. So if you're able to learn Swedish a little bit during your studies here in Sweden, uh, you will, of course, expand your opportunities for work. Now, for those of you who aren't aware of the really fantastic uh, area that we live in here in Sweden, uh, in southern Sweden, Lund is located in Skåne, which is essentially in the bottom, bottom tip of Sweden, about 45 minutes from Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark, by train, and about 10 minutes away from Malmö, which is Sweden's third largest city and sometimes considered sort of the cultural hub of Sweden. So we're in this really excellent kind of uh, corner of the world that's called the Orasund region or the Greater Copenhagen region, where you'll find, as you can see here, 14,000 different researchers, almost 200,000 students, numerous research parks, startup incubators, and 17 different universities. So Lund is just one of many. And as you can imagine, within that really dense uh, area of both research and education, there are a lot of different opportunities to get involved in the different industries and research and innovation centers that are located here and around our area. Also, just to touch a little bit on PhD studies, of course, we have a lot of students who are always interested in continuing on within academia. Of course, those of you who take on research as part of your extra opportunities, that can be something that helps you a lot there. But all of our master's degrees at Lund uh, make you eligible to continue on to PhD studies, uh, both in Sweden and abroad. And it's something that's quite popular uh, to do to stay either in Sweden or continue on for a PhD elsewhere. So this is another reason why if you're going to be conducting especially research within your department, you can really start making those connections early on in order to network and kind of open yourself up to those PhD opportunities in order to apply. And PhD uh, studies are something that are considered a job in Sweden. So it's essentially uh, you're applying to a paid position, unlike applying to a normal study program like a bachelor's or master's level position. So there is no kind of central process of applying to PhDs. I know already that might be a question we get in the chat, uh, but uh, it's something that essentially you're applying to a job opening whenever a, a department has has an option for a PhD. So that's something you can kind of take as you go. And just in the last couple notes here, I want to talk about some of the different opportunities in terms of the services that are actually available at the university to help you uh, do things like start your own business or really explore business in general, even if business is not necessarily what you're studying. There's a lot of really useful services here uh, that can be really interesting for you if you have an idea for a new business or an idea for something that you would like to grow your skills in. Uh, it can be a really excellent way to start. So first off is Venture Lab, which is the startup hub uh, that we have here at Lund specifically for students and for recent graduates. One of the really exciting things about Venture Lab is it doesn't matter where you study, you can study in engineering, you can study medicine, you can study art, uh, as long as you have an idea for a new service or a product or some kind of social innovation, you can use the resources at Venture Lab. Uh, they offer free confidential guidance in terms of getting advice on businesses. You can attend different lectures and events and workshops, and they also rent uh, office space for free to students uh, for up to a year if you're actually starting your own business. They also host the Lind Innovation Challenge every year, which is a three-day sort of uh, challenge where students work together to develop ideas and prototypes uh, and solve different business challenges. So again, this can be something that whether you're really invested in kind of a new idea or something to start, you can really dive deep into the opportunities that Venture Lab provides. Or if you just kind of want to get a little bit of inspiration, you can come to their events now and then. You don't necessarily have to have a new business that you're starting, but they have a lot of really great resources for you there. 
Next is the Lund University Student Innovation Center. So LU Innovation really works as the link between academia and studies and the businesses. So they also provide uh, help with students in making their business idea a reality and helping kind of find research that connects to that. So they connect students and researchers. So if you have a business idea, helping you find someone on the academic side who can really kind of help you convert that business based on the research that's being done uh, in that area. And these services are also free of charge and available for all students at the university. We also have the Sten K. Johnson Center for Entrepreneurship located in Lund, uh, which as the name uh, implies, gives a lot of different programs and resources in terms of entrepreneurship for people who are interested in starting their own business or learning more about entrepreneurship. There's a wide range of courses that you can take here. We also even offer a full master's degree at Lund in entrepreneurship uh, that you can take and courses can be taken both in Swedish and in English. Uh, to be studied kind of in addition to your regular courses, perhaps as an elective course as well. And finally, we have Ideon Science Park, uh, which is right next to Lund, right next to the business faculty built in 1983, and is intended to connect uh, the science and research aspect with innovators and entrepreneurs who are working in the business sector. Uh, so this was the first science park of its kind that was built anywhere in Sweden and anywhere in Northern Europe. And it was kind of built based on the idea of uh, Silicon Valley in uh, in the US. So it has really a diverse set of competencies in terms of the different uh, tech, especially, but different life science, food innovation, energy, uh, you name it, a lot of different really interesting businesses that start out of there. There are currently 400 companies operating out of a day on Science Park, and there have been about 1,200 since it began. And really big names that you might recognize, like Sony, Ericsson, Volvo, uh, have all had uh, time spent here in the Science Park and opportunities for students to really get involved and learn more, make those connections. So really to uh, kind of sum up here, the, the this brief overview is to take advantage of all the opportunities that you're offered here at Lund. There will be so many opportunities given to you to kind of expand your different skill sets, expand your CV, but also really have fun and enjoy the time outside of your studies at Lund in ways that maybe complement your studies in different ways, but can really gain a lot of valuable experience and help really set you up for a very successful career going forward. So now we're going to jump right into our panel discussion. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and jump back over here to our uh, students who I believe uh, are all starting back up their videos. But now I would like to uh, go around and formally really introduce everyone. So I would love, uh, since I can see we've had almost 40 or so students join since we introduced ourselves last. So if we could go around again and everyone could share again your name, what you're studying, where you're from, but this time a bit more in detail about uh, what exactly is the kind of extra experience that you're representing here today that you're going to share with us. Uh, so this time we can start with Alexandra. Hi, my name is Alexandra. I'm from Ukraine. I'm in my second year of international development and management program. And this program has a part uh, of, of the curricula, which uh, is internship. And this is a um, mandatory part of your course. So um, I had this opportunity to, to get internship and also to find um, an opportunity how to sustain myself by a part-time job, which is also um, a good case because it's on distance. Wonderful, thank you so much. Jana? Hi, my name is Jana. I'm from Germany and I'm also in my second year um, of a biology master, which is called Aquatic Ecology. And in this master program, you usually don't have an internship or it's nothing mandatory, but you can always choose to do so-called applied work instead of more courses. So um, instead of doing more courses, I joined the research group and conducted some research over the summer and until now still. Um, yeah, basically helping out the PhD and it included uh, going to a research station and doing some research there. Wonderful, thank you. Powell? Um, so my name is Powell. I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I study a bachelor's degree in economy and society, which is taught at the School of Economics and Management. I'm currently in my third year and fifth semester, and uh, this is usually the semester where we can do either an internship or a study abroad. And I did the last thing, so I went on my uh, exchange. Uh, I'm currently studying at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and uh, I'll share a bit more of my uh, experiences. Great. Prince? 
My name is Prince, I'm from Ghana and I'm studying the master's in public health. So the very first day we met our department, we were told that the third semester you have a choice to either do courses, do an exchange abroad, or do an internship. And one of the ways to do this internship is to do a summer project, which is fully funded by the Faculty of Medicine. So you could do the summer project and make it as your internship or not. So it's just a choice that you do. I did a summer project and use that as my internship as well. More on that later. Great. And Saskia? Uh, hello, my name is Saskia. I I'm in my second year and I'm studying biotechnology in the Faculty of Engineering. Um, I will be sharing mostly about a summer internship, but the internship that I did uh, is not part of the program because in my program, it is not mandatory to do an internship. Great. Well, I can see already that we have uh, a lot of questions here in the chat that are echoing what I would love to ask as my first question, which is, of course, how did you find uh, placement either in your internships or in study abroad? Uh, basically, how did you get involved in what you've been involved in? And did you have any support from the university or the program kind of in helping you find that or not? So maybe we'll go back around the opposite way. So we'll start with Saskia this time. Um, so, um, how I found my internship is through LinkedIn, so it was quite a long process. If you would like to read my full complete story, I posted as well on the Unibody blog, but um, I know from the beginning that I wanted to do an internship, so I was I started looking during the beginning of the year, started to apply, send my CV and motivation letter to a lot of companies, uh, reach out to connections through LinkedIn. Um, but um, overall, my internship search was is really, is completely separated from the program and the university. So I did this search and application all by myself. Okay, great. I'm actually posting in the chat uh, the blog that you wrote about your internship task. Yeah, I think that's a great, uh, great thing to point out. Great. Uh, Prince. Yeah, so as I said earlier, the very first week for the orientation, we also have program orientations. So during the program, we had um, current students who had done um, summer research projects and internships to uh, come to talk to us about their journey. And so I wanted to do a research. Actually, the research brought me to Lund University. I fell in love with Lund because of the research that is being done here in Lund. So I thought the best way to do was to get involved in this uh, research. So already, even this year, they've already sent out notifications that this is open as well for students. So you apply, just go to the website, you apply for the uh, research. And if you are accepted, then you have to write a protocol. But before you write the protocol, then you have to actually contact some researchers. And one of the avenues to do that is to go to the mm -hmm. University Research Portal, and you can just read about the researches that is ongoing, and you can reach out to researchers and talk about to, to them about what you're interested in. Another avenue to also do that is to contact uh, lecturers. Of course, <laughs> all my lecturers are also researchers and also guest lecturers who are also researchers as well, if you're interested in what they do, and then they could offer you that research internship. So I had wrote a lot of emails and then I was referred to other people which helped me to, to get the internship. So I had an interview with uh, the research project group and they were very happy to have me. And so my idea was to have the research and help me to do my thesis and then hopefully do my PhD. So that is why I went into the um, summer research project. And another good idea is that when you do the summer research well uh, in your test semester or during the summer, whether you use it as an internship or not, you have the opportunity to do another summer research program which you can actually also use to also easily extend your stay here in Sweden if you're looking to stay in Sweden. So that's also a good opportunity there. Yeah, wonderful. A lot of great uh, information and tips there. Thanks, Prince. And Powell, for you, of course, uh, it's a little bit different than necessarily finding an internship or research on your own, but can you share a bit more about kind of how you found out about the study abroad and what resources were available to help you make that a reality? Yeah, so um, already before I made my decision of like what to study, I already wanted to look for a bachelor's degree that provides the opportunity to study abroad because I think it would be such a wonderful opportunity, even though, of course, I already went to Sweden to study my bachelor's. Um, and I was contacted during my 
second year uh, during my bachelor's by our faculty. Uh, and they really facilitate us of doing this because we have a full semester where we can do our own electives. And a lot of bachelor's students decide to go abroad and uh, do, a, do an exchange or an internship. Um, so we're really facilitated with this. And uh, the process is actually quite easy. They uh, provide you with a list of exchange university you can apply for uh as a bachelor student and yeah you just have to make sure that you meet the deadlines and then hopefully you get the place that you uh, wanted and for me i uh, also aimed for my exchange destination which was hong kong um and i fortunately got it and uh, honestly the support from the faculty has been wonderful um they're very close with the students so i've been able to co come to their office all the time that i had questions and that kind of stuff so it was super super helpful so that's been very nice keep up a little bit with what everyone's saying and posting some things in the chat as well <laughs> related so if you see me looking to the side a little bit that's what I'm doing but uh, just to backtrack a little bit I've posted the link there to the summer research scholarship that Prince uh, mentioned earlier so you can read a bit more about it there and of course uh, we actually I remembered had another student uh, Liviana Michelle who is currently studying abroad in uh, Switzerland who wrote a blog recently about the different ways that the university supports you when getting ready for study abroad so I've posted that there as well but Yana how about you how did you get involved in the different research that you're doing? Uh, for me, this was really, really easy because I, I was just in a lecture and then that day we had some professors uh, come into our lecture and present some of the topics that you could possibly do for your thesis. But there was also a professor that presented a PhD uh, student's work or work that was planned and who was looking for some field assistance or yeah, it was basically a bit advertised as an internship and then I just emailed to this PhD student that I would like to help and uh, that it sounds really great what he's doing and then <laughs> it was just uh, yeah very much decided like oh yeah great here we go uh, very informal actually and very very simple and in general I think if you want to have a, a research project or want to help somewhere usually just approach the research group and they're usually to, uh, happy to have some additional help. Wonderful, thank you. And Alexandra? So as, um, as internship is uh, a part of, um, of my program, we of course knew when entering program that there's gonna be something interesting next autumn, so it's third semester. And we have it, um, as we have it mandatory, we have to find it um, during our first year because to save your internship place, uh, it might take quite a while from one month to half a year. So it depends where you want to have your internship placement. Uh, we did have support from the faculty um, and our department. So our course coordinator actually provided us with the list of organizations where are there students have been already placed uh, during previous years. However, we didn't have direct contact because contacts are protected by law. <laughs> and this is uh, the reason why we had only the list of organizations. But to secure your place, internship place, it's up to you. So you have to find it yourself and have to pass all the processes, interviews, negotiations, and all this stuff. Um, of course, you have some specific requirements, which will be because it's mandatory part. So we had requirement that it should last not uh, less than three months uh, of a full-time job um, and uh, also it should be in development field so the the field is huge and uh, you can get into NGOs you can get into international organization into business so my classmates spread around the world and around the organization um, I joined UNDP team and it was a home-based internship uh, which I started in late May uh, because they wanted to have a long internship and it had six months and I had to finish it by by end of November to enter the next course. So this is the way how, uh, how I found it. I found it actually by public link, public uh, applying through UNDP website. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I actually want to uh, stick with you for a moment, Alexandra, because I think uh, there are some other questions here that are really relevant there. Uh, for example, someone's asking, uh, did you require approval from the university in terms of the internship that you chose? And what was that process like in, in terms for them to basically decide that you would be able to get the credit since your internship was required as part of your program? 
Yeah, so um, actually, because it is a part, of course, you have to um, you have to provide uh, documents which confirm that confirm that you are actually doing internship actually in specific organization. Um, so how it is approved? It is approved um, specifically by the document which is called Memorandum of Understanding, which is assigned by a student and a hosting organization. It's a formal way how you uh, understand the terms of your internship and also what functions are you going to um, actually do during your internship and then you submit this uh, template which is filled with the data to your course convenor and then course convenor checks if, if the um, dates are fine if the timing is good and if there is any development challenge you're going to work on and then it's like super easy approval if you listened before <laughs> Um, and about how, how it is integrated into, into academia. So we had during, uh, during this internship semester, we had three different assignments. And one of them was this memorandum of understanding. So you have to draft it, you have to negotiate it, and then to submit it as a first assignment. Then we had also a pretty intense reflection paper uh, in which we reflected about management challenges in development field. Uh, which is academic work. So we had to use all the references and all this stuff and also our practical experience, which was great way how you enter field and then you connect dots with the theory which you learned previous year. And the last assignment was about how you finished your assignment and did you receive any confirmation of, uh, of your um, successful <laughs> doing internship? Um, yeah, so basically the program managed to have less assignments, extensive list of reading, of course, which you will use for, um, for assistance to make the work and also to write the reflection paper. Absolutely. Thank you. And I would say that's quite uh, standard for most programs that uh, do require an internship. Uh, exactly what Alexander described, you will kind of be required in some way or another. The actual paperwork and process might vary a little bit from program to program, but to sort of confirm that you do have an internship and it is relevant uh, in order for that to count since that is a requirement, definitely. Um, but okay, we have uh, a lot of questions coming in here, so I'm trying to decide which which way to go next. But I think uh, one thing that's interesting uh, to hear about, we have someone who's asked uh, if anyone knows someone who spent a third semester abroad, but I would kind of like to expand this to actually say, of course, it's, it's wonderful to hear that all of you are taking advantage of these opportunities, but what would you say in terms of your classmates? Do you know others who are doing similar opportunities, or is it kind of just you who's taking advantage of this? Uh, so not necessarily just study abroad, though that's great. Also, if you know classmates who've studied abroad, but do you know others who've gotten involved in internship and research as well? So maybe we'll uh, go around actually to ask everyone about this. So we'll uh, start with Yana. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, yeah, actually, a lot of my classmates also do some applied work and help in research projects because that's just a really good way to learn how it actually works in academia and if you want to stay within research um so from my friend group i think uh like 80 percent <laughs> are doing this um so yeah i think it's quite popular wow that's great to hear Powell, what about you did most people take the internship or the study abroad option for your program uh, I think that by far the biggest majority of people uh, decide to go uh, on exchange. Uh, there is some people, like some individuals that they do an internship, but I think that is a small minority. And it's really for the few that really, I think, know what kind of industry they want to explore and are very entrepreneurial in this. But most people go with the study abroad option. Okay. And uh, since it ties in really specifically to the question Marcos asked, uh, do you normally always do the exchange in the fifth semester or do some folks do it in the third semester? Um, good question. It's always in the fifth semester for uh, the international bachelors that Lund University offers. Um, there's also some um, bachelors in Sweden, in Swedish, that the university offers, and then it's a bit more modular, so then you can do it in different semesters. But if you're an international student at Lund University and you're doing a bachelor's, it's always in the fifth semester. Exactly. Great. And Prince, what about you? Is uh, Do you know others that have taken advantage both of the summer research scholarship, but also other opportunities? Yes, so actually I'm in the international officer for um, the master's in public health program. So uh, students who actually go on exchange studies, uh, I help them actually apply for it. So we had uh, about three students going to the University of um, 
Melbourne in Australia to do exchange studies, but most of my colleagues were into internships. And most of their internship also came about during some of our courses that we're doing, because some of the courses you have to do protocols or projects. And some of them, for example, talking about food processing, um, sustainability, so it depends on what they wanted to do. And there are always researchers around to help you or guide you. So those went into that and they have developed that during their summer research, for example, in their internships. And they are continuing with the topics they use for their, their summer research or their internships into their thesis and hopefully also into their uh, PhDs. And so you have only a few people taking courses. So only people taking the courses that university offered during the test semester. And it's always during the test semester that you can have this. So you have actually three options. You have an internship, exchange, or you have um, courses. So for the internship, we do a short internship, eight weeks. But if you do the summer project, it's 10 weeks. So summer project, then you do two extra courses because you already have four courses within the semester. So that is a choice that you make. So I can say many of my colleagues even now have jobs that they can go to right after completion because they are working for companies or for research teams that will want to also even give them jobs right after they have completed the activity. So basically I think you have to make up your mind what you are after and what you're looking for. And the faculty also usually sends us um, emails of these um, industries who also need um, internships or something like that. And there's all, also always um, previous work to also rely on where people also did their internships or did their exchange that you can rely on. So you, of course you can do your thing anywhere that you want, but for my program, it is easier to do with the University of Melbourne in Australia, but you can do it across the world. But you have to get one that actually has similar courses in Lund University in terms of quality. But other than that, you can do any courses at all. For example, you can do courses in music, in arts, in uh, politics, in law, because the actual credit hours that you need for the public health master program will actually be captured in the rest of the semesters. So doing an internship elsewhere wouldn't matter. And then when you're doing an exchange somewhere, the only thing that has to also be done is the applied research methodology because you need that for your thesis work, which you usually would have also done epidemiology, uh, qualitative research and biostatistics before. So yeah, it's just a choice and just getting into that choice and then going forward with it. So I chose the summer research project because I wanted to be in research. And, and for that, you, you have to write your own application, apply for it. And when you get it, you have to write a proposal, just like you're doing any research. So you write a proposal, the um, researcher who has to be supervising, you have to also read through it and certify that it's okay, then you send it. And then when it is accepted, then it means that you're going to get this uh, summer scholarship. So the summer scholarship is for 10, 10 weeks or two months, uh, but there's a caveat. So I could have used the summer research project and still gone on an internship, or going to do an exchange, it is possible to do that. But if I did that, because I am uh, a non-EU student, I'll have to pay additional fees. So either I take the scholarship and not pay fees and then use the summer research scholarship as my internship, then I don't need to pay extra fees. But during the, which is what I did. So during the last two months, because my, the data I was using for my uh, research could not be used for thesis, unfortunately, I have to find a new uh, research team for my thesis. And so I used the two months that I had because I had already done summer research project during the summer to find a new uh, research team to work with for my thesis. And hopefully I got one and they are now even working on my application so that I can actually use that for my thesis and hopefully uh, we'll continue on thereafter. So just decide on what you want to do. It is possible to do an internship. It is possible to do an exchange or do courses, but decide on what you want and then just go for it. And you have all the support that you need from the lecturers themselves, from the researchers around. Everybody here is so passionate about helping you achieve your goal. I mean, that is the essence of you Lund University to make sure that you develop professionally and personally so that of course, when you're an alumni, you can also contribute to the university. So that is assured.
did the typical mute myself. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a lot of really great advice there. Thank you so much, Brent. So it really sounds like from, from everyone that uh, this is not just something you're doing, but something that really most students are taking advantage of these opportunities. So I would really uh, kind of send that message through to the audience that if you are to come study it in Lund, you should really take advantage of all these options that are available. Uh, so kind of piggybacking off a little bit of what you said, Prince, about the different uh, ways that you can kind of use these different experiences and also uh, tagging into a question we have here from Vivian about about, uh, the avenues for skill development. I would love to hear from everyone kind of what are the the main benefits that you've had from doing this experiment and what uh, experiment experience sorry and what uh, what skills do you feel like you've developed from from taking on these different options so perhaps Alexandra we can start with you. Yep uh, so well I would say that the internship for me was a great way to um, to slow my working experience down and also to to see to see practical experience from theoretical approach like what we've learned and what approaches we learned and how is you know well presented in in books and in presentations but then you come to reality and you see that for example development field doesn't actually work the way how it is written however there are some approaches which are super efficient and you can gain it and you can you know like pack this in your backpack and move forward so for me uh, internship is about great connections I got great experience in talking to the team and those with whom we cooperated within these six months but it, it is also about seeing how differently international organizations are working in compared to local NGOs, for example, or NGOs in specific country. So having this uh, um, helicopter view kind of on, on what is happening around and how sustainability or impact are included uh, in program development, that was um, a great part. So knowledge, skills, and also a great network. Absolutely, a lot of great benefits there. Thank you. Jana, what about you? What have been the main skills that you've developed and things to take away from your research? Uh, so practical experience, I've gained a lot. So a lot of the things that I did during my research work on this research station, which uh, is a bit north from Lund, um, around the Gothenburg area, um, it's a marine research station. So what I'm used to doing in the lab, all of a sudden we did on a boat, which can be uh, quite wavy and it's a new environment. So that's definitely something to learn. Also, I learned how it is to live at a research station where your workplace is your home. I learned how to take breaks <laughs> or that it's very important to take breaks. And also, as Alexandra already said, the networking is worth so much. Because not only do you grow together with your research team a lot and it helps you to work independently because even though I'm just the master student so working with very experienced researchers I was always able to share my thoughts and I was really happy when my thoughts were actually like oh yeah that's a great idea let's do it that way I was like, okay <laughs> um, and you also get to know researchers that you otherwise would only read papers from um, that's yeah, in the in the world of research, this can be quite uh, yeah starstruck. I was I was a bit starstruck in the start, but then you just grow friends. And then, for example, now I would have been able to go back to that research station to do my master's thesis. Decided to stay in Lund, but the networking is worth a lot. Yeah, absolutely for sure. Saskia, what about you? Uh, since uh, my research, uh, since my um, summer internship. Um, experience has been related to research as well actually it is um, but it is done in the startup company it's nice to see like a different point of view of it like it's interesting how to see that the research that I usually do in a typical laboratory setting can actually help to solve like a real life problem um, and as everyone has mentioned before it's also very nice to build up connection because I'm also able to talk with the CEO with the researcher and learn more and more of the business business aspect of biotechnology i can learn how to for example bring a product that started originally as a research into the market and all of the other uh and other uh, business aspects that i didn't get the chance to learn uh during my education so it's a really good experience wonderful thank you and Powell, I know uh, research and internship kind of have a somewhat a bit of an obvious way that that develops your skills, but what would you say uh, have been really the benefits of studying abroad in terms of kind of things to take away? 
Um, that's a very broad question because there are so many experiences that I've met, like had uh, last semester. Um, I could say that from more an educational uh, standpoint, it's definitely very interesting to familiarize yourself as a bachelor's student with different educational institutions to see how uh, academia has tackled abroad and how uh, that might differ from country to country. So that has been very uh, like a learning experience for me. On a personal, um, more on a personal level, for me, it's been very nice to develop my intercultural communication skills. Um, and obviously, in an exchange university, uh, the student population differs greatly from Lund, for example. So then, you know, I've been able to meet people with so many different nationalities. Obviously, also to look at a lot of local students, and it's been so interesting to hear all, all their experiences and to get to know so many people, so many different people with different backgrounds. Um, so I think overall, both on a personal level and on an educational level, I've learned a lot over the last couple of months. That's been very nice. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, I see we have a question here. Someone's asking specifically about uh, the master's program in bioinformatics and what the difference is between the two different courses. So I'm actually going to send you here the link to our current student who's studying bioinformatics, because I think maybe they'd be a better resource for you to kind of ask about specific different courses. But this also brought up uh, an idea for me that I'd like to ask our folks who have been doing research. We've kind of touched on it a little bit, but I'd like to dive in a bit deeper in terms of actually doing research, but then also having your final thesis. Uh, what has been the connection in terms of uh, if you've been able to or if you know people who've been able to use your research that you've done to kind of complement your thesis or if it inspired your thesis um what's that really been the connection there so I'll, I'll leave that open for whoever would like to to talk about that a bit Yana um so the the applied work that I did um I didn't do all by myself I also had a different or another master student that was also working on the same thing and she's actually uh, my good friend and she's going to do her master thesis in the same topic. And she might be able to use the project that we did now during the summer until now. Also, she could use the data for her thesis. And it's always nice to have a, a broad data set, because if you do a 30 credits thesis, which is a master thesis, which would be one semester technically, that's 20 weeks, which is not a lot when you do an experiment, at least in biology. And I'm sure it's very much the same for all the others. So it's very, very handy to have some, some data beforehand and also some experience. Definitely, thank you. Alexandra. Well, in my case, it's more of inspiration, less of actual data, but also something that brought me to the opportunity to combine my professional knowledge and also my inspiration something I love to research so it's just combined in the way because you have time to think actually and to choose the topic while you are doing the internship uh, however in in case of several of my group mates they managed to uh, to have their data collection with within their internship placement with the host organization and some even managed to get um, a research grant for a couple of months to to actually to do data collection either in the same country they are now or in a different settlement so it, it just literally and absolutely about uh, what you want to do and uh, the options are available you just have to have to work and meet the all the deadlines absolutely thank you and prince yes so um so i have many of my friends who use actually projects that you are working in class to even do their summer projects and to continue with that during their thesis so it just flows through and I have not actually had that opportunity, even though that was what I wanted, but that was not my main goal of doing the summer research project. My main goal was to actually understand what I was doing. One of the things was to also uh, learn about the Swedish work culture where you have personal responsibility for everything that you do, and also uh, learn skills that will help me to do my thesis. So even if it didn't lead to doing the thesis directly, I would have gotten experience in, for example, using startup because Stata is what I, I used in the summer research project. And we are actually doing another course, which is applied methodology, and we are using Stata. And I can see most of my friends who actually did not do an internship, research-based internship, actually suffering with, with that. But those who did actually the internship, we are really on, on top of issues. And, and so in that regard, that is very important. I'll be working with a cohort study of about 9,000 people. 
that is very, very small. It, I, I mean, because I worked on data for about 4 million participants. So 9,000, 4 million, it's, it's nothing. So getting that experience is really, really nice. And it, it also makes you also have the real thesis experience, even though you're not doing thesis. Because during my project, I got sick for a week, COVID, and my computer crashed. And so I was so overwhelmed because there was so much I had to do. And so not doing that for one week when I was sick, I could not bear it. But the research team was very supportive as well. They supported me. So I always say that I always reference them when I'm comparing to another research team because they gave me the support that I needed. And they also gave me a laptop to also work with. That mean, meant that I did not have to waste those times that my computer was down. So it really gives you an opportunity to actually go on. And for right now, I was also working on a side project and I had help from my summer project team. Even though I was not doing the project with them, I could ask them questions because they had also worked on similar projects. So I asked them, okay, I'm going to work on this project. And I read that you also worked on this project before. How did you go about it? Why did you make the choices that you did? And then they can explain it to you. And in that way, it can also help you do whatever you are doing. So right now, I'm not even doing the same cohort as they are. But even during my thesis, I can still reach out to them if I have a problem because I know that if they have also worked on that before, that is important to also reach out to them. And doing research is important to have collaboration with other researchers because you are always faced with problems that you, you are not able to solve, but other people have solved it before or may even give you um, a reference to somebody who has already done that before because they've read it or because they had a course on that or attended um, a workshop or a seminar on that. So in, in that case, even if it doesn't really straight away to your thesis or even to your PhD, it is a resource that is so important that you don't have to miss it if you are into research, whether it is qualitative research or quantitative research. Really love that you brought up as well that uh, doing a lot of these different opportunities gives you an, a chance to learn about Swedish work culture as well, because that's something that, of course, many students are interested in staying in Sweden afterwards and looking for work. So that's also an aspect of, of these different opportunities that you really can't uh, can't overlook for sure. So we have a question here at the top that's been uploaded quite a lot, so I want to make sure I get to it. That's wondering about if there's any lists of NGOs in Sweden to volunteer with to gain experience. Um, so I don't know if there's necessarily like one grand master list, uh, but Alexandra, you have uh, something to share here. Yeah, so actually I was looking at a Swedish organization's one uh, searching for internship. Because I'm non-EU student, so I have my residence permit here and not to, to overcomplicate with documents. And there are several resources where you can find uh, uh, about NGOs. I will share the links in chat if it's okay, just in a couple of minutes. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. I think one thing I would add here as well is that quite a lot of, even if there isn't kind of one master list at the university, quite a lot of programs uh, who especially have uh, studies that are relate to a lot of the work that different NGOs do might have specific connections within your department to specific NGOs. So that can always be something to talk to your program coordinator about because they might have some specific suggestions there too. Prince? Yes, I think one of the importance of having an international international a group of students is that many of my colleagues also know about these volunteering organizations. So as I said, during the last two months that I wasn't doing anything, I actually wanted to go into uh, volunteering. So my friend said, okay, if you want to go into volunteering, I can just connect you. So the avenues that you can you can go to, I mean, there's the Red Cross that you can go and volunteer. I mean, there's a lot. So you just have to connect with people, even ask your your lecturers or your colleagues, um, those from Sweden and those also not from Sweden because they may have had resources uh, in some places that you might not have known. So that network is really, really important. So I would say that that is something that you get when you're in London University. You are never short of opportunities. Absolutely, for sure. 
So we have a question somewhere here. Let me find it. Yes, about uh, studying abroad with Erasmus and if you need to choose your own university or not. So maybe, Paolo, could you share a bit uh, on kind of the how how you found out essentially which uh, universities you could study with or if you could have kind of made your own or if it was easier to go with one of the ones that aligned with your program? Yeah, of course. Um, it depends uh, on which faculty you study at. I can explain for my faculty, there's a school of economics and management, but like I said, it differs between faculties. Uh, so at my faculty, there is a database that you can access as, as a student uh, at the faculty. It's actually public as well, I believe. So you can also navigate it yourself if you want to take a look what all the options are. Um, and in this database, you can filter for your own degree and when you're supposed to go on exchange and then automatically um, turns out a list basically of all the available partner universities that you might apply for. Um, so then you can also filter, for example, for continent and only filter for exchange universities in Europe uh, in case you're interested, interested in doing an Erasmus exchange in particular, because that is basically your, an exchange at a Europe, other European university, at other university in the European Union. Um, yeah, and then you can use this uh, database and the tools it provides uh, to basically search for your perfect destination. And uh, it's all integrated with a platform that I believe the university as a whole uses, but I can at least ensure for my faculty. Uh, it's called Soul Move, and that's just a general application system that you use um, in case you want to apply for an exchange destination. And there you uh, upload your um, your CV, your motivation letter, and uh, you fill in all the required details uh, that that they need uh, in order for your application to be valid. So that's basically the kind of how the process works and how you find your exchange uh, university. Absolutely. Great. Thanks. And I would refer back in the chat again to uh, the blog I posted earlier under study abroad support, because there you can read a bit more about Soul Move and about those different uh, resources as well. But I want to stick with you for a moment here, Paolo, to also ask uh, someone else is wondering about what are the chances that you get accepted into a study abroad program? Uh, so is there really a, a risk, uh, a lot of competition for studying abroad or kind of what, how does that process work? <laughs> Um, honestly, I think it's very, very rare to not get an exchange university at all. I think that hardly ever happens because they really try to make sure that for every person that applies for an exchange university, at least ends up somewhere. Um, the odds of you getting in for your preferred destination are slightly slimmer because um, there is a selection process. It mostly depends on your grades, but other factors that they take into account is, for example, uh, your letter of motivation um and yeah mostly that and also extracurricular experiences you might have done for example uh, having worked or um having some other experiences that might be relevant um what is very nicely done at my faculty is that every uh, student uh, is allowed to basically rank their um their preferred destinations so in case they cannot copy you with your preferred option your number one at least they'll go down to the second option on your list and see if maybe your potential match for that and uh, if there's a spot for you there so I, you are allowed to uh, list up to 15 preferred destinations and you can rank them. And I think the odds of you getting in of one of those 15 are extremely high. And other than if that, if you don't even manage for that, then there's always a second round uh, held a couple of months after where then all the spare places are filled and you can uh, often also get a place through that. So you'll almost certainly end up at a destination, but whether it's the one you have on your um, number one, that is hard to say, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Thank you so much. And Prince, you have something to add there since you work with the exchanges and your faculty. Yes. So uh, I think, as he was saying, it is also program based, so program to program. So my program has that with the University of um, Melbourne in Australia. So it's, if you apply, the chances of you, those who applied, all of them got in. And they also have students also coming from Australia, of course, also to, to study uh, in my program. So that is easy to, to get. Uh, once you apply, because by the time you do that, you will have all the resources because they will give you the information. The international committee will always give you an information as when it is happening, when the deadline is, and what you're supposed to do throughout the way to get into it. So by the time you, the deadline is due, you've met all the requirements to get into that. One interesting thing is that in the university, particularly even for my program, students are very um pivot when it comes to making decisions so probably there's an exchange you want somewhere that we don't have an exchange with as a program as students if you have more people interested in that then that is a possibility that that could happen 
And uh, recently I sent out a, a survey as to where students want to have an exchange in, because there are possibilities across the globe, um, in the Nordic countries, in Europe, but of course also in Africa and Asia. So if, if there's more students wanting to do something, then the, uh, the program is ready to also engage officially to have an exchange agreement with them. But even if the program does not have an exchange program with them, out of the 650 universities that the university has partnership with, you can also go to those places as well. Um, so it, it's just a matter of choice and what you want. And so if you want to do an essay in a particular place and you're coming to my program, then you must start discussing uh, really early with the program director, with the international office at the time and in the, with the program, so that um, such, such a amount of understanding could be with, because it takes a lot of time to, to have an exchange agreement, but they cannot help you do, do your exchange there if you want to. But if many people want it, then they can do an exchange agreement so that it's easier for students to switch into, into that. And then I'm also also add that it's also easier to also do uh, some uh, mobility with um, the European University Alliance for Global Health, uh, Health which is called EUGLO. Um, we have five universities now in come general it's going to be nine universities. So we have universities in uh, Norway, Spain, Serbia, France, two in Germany, uh, one in Portugal, and then of course the university as well. So you can go and do internship in these universities and it will be quite easier to do that actually. So you can also look into that. Absolutely. And that kind of answers one of the questions we had here specifically for you, Prince, about when you talked about that you do a course, an internship or an exchange, and someone wondered, could you do an internship abroad with another university or a company? So it looks like the answer is yes. Great. Um, I also want to mention, uh, Alexandra has helped me find quite a few uh, links here where you can find NGOs uh, lists to volunteer with and things. So I've posted those in the chat. Uh, I also noticed we have a lot of questions here in the chat about specifically uh, kind of working with a one, uh, one year person number and uh, kind of some quite specific questions about coming to Sweden before and coming back on a one year program in person number. So I'm putting the contact link to my office here because I think those are questions that are uh, you better off if you send us an email and we can kind of get more in depth with you there uh, rather than here while we have the current students here. So I want to focus more on those questions. Um, but uh, next, something we, we haven't touched on too much yet, but I think is really nice to share about as well is, of course, in general at the university, we do have some different areas of support uh, for finding future careers and jobs and things as I believe actually everyone, all of our panel here today are in your final year, correct? So you'll all be graduating next year. So maybe that's something you're starting to think about a little bit as is future jobs and things. Um, so of course, we do have a career center uh, centrally at the university who puts on different internships and uh, sorry, webinars and workshops and things and has their own website where you can search for jobs. We have a central alumni network as well that you can be a part of uh, after you graduate and when you're getting ready to graduate. Certain faculties have their own career center as well, for example, the Faculty of Economics. Uh, so perhaps I'd just like to open up to the floor. Has anybody had any experiences uh, kind of attending any of these uh, services that are offered in terms of career and alumni events and things? Uh, and how has that experience been for you? Alexandra. I've done, joined a couple of events and also watched the previous year's uh, videos. And it was super helpful in terms of preparing your CV and preparing cover letters and motivation letters, which are totally different from my previous experience in Ukraine. So Sweden has its own, you know, uh, specific requirements and you have to adapt and you also have to um, work on, on your statements, on your cover letters, and you have to dive in a lot of organizations if you want to work in there and to understand their values, to read through their website and to, to see what impact are, uh, are they doing. So to me, sessions were super specific and I, I do encourage everyone to, to join and to listen because um, job market in every country is, you know, a mystery. So you can start uh, um, uncovering this mystery by, by preparing for that. Absolutely. Some great tips there. Thank you. Prince? Yeah, so I also I joined this uh, career fair, of course, uh, for my CV. And I, I did a CV and then uh, it was reviewed, uh, had a chat, and then I actually even have a personal 
uh, email now that I can write to her so that uh, if there's, for example, a job advertisement that I'm not even interested in, I could now do a CV to specifically meet that ad and then send to her so that she can review and see, okay, it meets this ad or it does not. So that these are the corrections. And that gives you the idea because you cannot have one CV for everything because every ad has requirements and uh, there are salient points that must be in your CV. So kind of helping you adapt your CV. So you can have a master CV anyway, then you adapt the master CV to the ads that, I mean, to the job that you are applying for or something like that, which is really, really good. So, yeah. Absolutely. And kind of tying in here, we have a question about if the university gives any help in, term, in terms of finding jobs uh, when you graduate or if you need to contact companies all by yourself. So I think we, we've we touched on this a little bit. So uh, unlike I know it is common in some countries that the university actually kind of sets up jobs for you, which, of course, sounds very lovely, but uh, that's not the case here in Sweden. Uh, but instead, of course, what happens is we do have these central support systems to kind of help put on career fairs or workshops and things to sort of empower you to be prepared to go out and look for jobs yourself afterwards. So you have support in that there's resources, there's of course networking opportunities, but it is you in the end who must apply for jobs after you graduate. Great. So we're uh, coming down now in our, in our number of questions. We have a lot of great questions here today and we have about uh, 20 minutes left if anyone else in the audience has any other questions, but we'll try to make sure we get through all of them. Um, so we have uh, some questions here next about actually working in Sweden. So that's something we haven't really touched on yet so much. So I'd love to talk a bit more just first off, actually, for the panel. Does anyone have any part time jobs uh, that you do and kind of what has been your experience in finding that or in managing having a part time job on the side of studies? So a lot, <laughs> a lot of folks here. Great. So maybe Saskia, we'll start with you. We haven't heard from you in a while. <laughs> yeah, so um, I've been actually so. I'm currently, I currently have a part-time job, but it is remote. Um, I got it by applying through LinkedIn. Um, it is about a pod, podcast marketing, so it's not really directly related to what I'm studying. But I think like about how I manage it. Maybe I can share a little bit how I manage it while I study. Um, I think it is nice to have a part-time job that is relatively a bit more flexible for me because I have quite like a, uh, quite tight lab and course schedule so I think that that's an important thing that you that we always have to remember when we take part-time jobs like remember how and like plan before applying how we would align it with the studies that we're doing like if we have enough time if we have not because um, if that if in the case that our studies are very packed uh, we don't we uh, we don't want to um, we don't want the part-time job to interrupt it. Absolutely. Very good point to make there that you always want to make sure your studies come first if you're looking for jobs, for sure. Paolo, what about you? Um, so yeah, I'm working part time at a, a scale up in Copenhagen. They contacted me on LinkedIn uh, during my second year at university. Um, they are specialized in AI technology for e-commerce businesses, uh, and I work basically in their sales department. Um, for me, it's been quite easy to combine it with my studies, although I only started there in April last year, like in 2022 and during April. Um, they're very flexible. So for me, it's been quite easy to combine it with studying. I can both, both work at the office in Copenhagen or work remotely. I've actually been able to do a bit of work also during my exchange remotely during some evenings that I have free. So that was actually quite nice. Uh, overall, I think for me, it has been very nice to also meet other uh, students at my uh, at my um, employer, uh, for example, students that study in Copenhagen or different universities. So I think it's always nice to spice up your uh, social environment. Um, yeah, for me, it's been quite easy to combine it with my studies. I think the workload is manageable, but obviously to make uh, kind of a consideration for yourself, whether you're able to combine that with your studies. Uh, for some people, that might be very difficult. For others, it might be very easy. Like I now work approximately two days a week um, and it's fairly manageable together with my studies, but you do need some good time skills, uh, time management skills, I think personally. It's not for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Alexandra. And so I do have um, a part-time job and I got it only uh, this year during my internship because I managed to combine um, internship where I had um, less working days in some weeks so I have a part-time job and I spend like one and a half two days a week on doing that uh, it is also flexible as um, colleagues said so I can 
I can manage my time in my own comfort. Um, but to be honest, during the first year, I wouldn't manage it because it was super intense. We had, a, first of all, you are integrating new society. You are starting, you are coming to other country. You are coming to a huge amount of people around you. But also uh, you're adjusting to learning and to to different way of university studies, like compared to my previous studies, this is total different experience uh, with the amount of academic writing and academic uh, reading and, and huge, huge reading lists, which are never, never ending. And this is this sounds uh, a, a bit maybe scary, but uh, once you start understanding, start prioritizing, start understanding this strange academic English language, which is sometimes used in articles, um, it's getting easier. And you're, you're just, uh, you know how much time you actually need to read the article or to write the assignment for some specific amount of wording. So uh, I would say that I wouldn't do that in first year of any studies and give yourself you know some time to enjoy to enjoy the year to enjoy the student environment and to to enjoy classes uh, to start you know expanding your thoughts and your mind but then the second year if there is opportunity then it's a good way how to sustain yourself and how to get some funds when the studies are ending but the job is not still there right so it's just a way how you can uh, collect some some fundings uh, kind of a financial pillow for, for yourself um yeah uh, i do work at an organization which is located in ukraine and i do provide the consultancy um and it, it's just my personal feeling that i want to contribute to my country at this moment and also having huge experience in project management before i can contribute there more here in sweden in terms of what I'm looking for and uh, options, what I need, I have to work more on Swedish language, to be honest, like to feel more mm, comfortable in the environment. It's not the, the huge requirement, but it is a great way how you can communicate with the team and how you can bring your, your professional network uh, um, inside of the company. So this is my plan for future, <laughs> to work more on Swedish language and then to, to get the opportunity to find jobs everywhere where is a possible way. Wonderful. Thank you, Alexandra. And Prince? Yes, so I have not been involved in any part-time job yet. Um, I would have, but I, we agreed that it was important for me to do my courses and prepare for my thesis, which was better for me. And I would like to mention that in the university, you have a study advisor. So whatever you do, I will run it by the study advisor as well. And it is also important to also get a mentor so that you, you can share what you want to do and how you probably will be able to manage it. Because sometimes you can get into it and you become overwhelmed and you might want to shut down. That is why this support is available for you. So you can tell your study advisor, okay, this is my plan, this is what I want to do. This is my study schedule. And in Sweden, Lund, you'll be informed to spend eight hours a day studying. And that is if you use the eight hours a day to read, because there's a lot of intense reading. But if you use the eight hours, then you'll be okay. You'll be free. You can, can involve yourself in the discussions. When it comes to doing your group work, uh, personal assignment, you'll be able to do that. But if you do not do that and you do not manage your studies well, it, even though you have chances to rewrite it again and get an A or a pass or distinction, you want you do not want to always have to rewrite exams and that that could be stressful sometime for you. So it is important to involve your study uh, advisor and maybe your mentor and um, the lecturers here are willing to be your mentor. You can even be a mentor back in your home country. It doesn't have to be necessarily here in Sweden. And then they can help you uh, in that regard, whether you need to have a part-time job and how to also manage it is really, really important so that it doesn't negatively affect your studies because first and foremost, that is why you're here to study. 
For sure. Really good to keep that in mind. Definitely. So I want to give a few little kind of rapid fire answers to some of the questions we have here in the chat, uh, also related to working. So uh, again, someone here is applying to a one year master's, which means you won't have a Swedish person number and is wondering if that will affect uh, how you want to work. Uh, unfortunately, probably yes, mostly just that it will be probably a bit harder to find uh, places that are able to hire you without a person number. It doesn't mean that it will be impossible because you still do have a right to work in Sweden, uh, but sometimes it can be a bit difficult uh, to kind of get more of a formal job where it's a bit easier for them to process you in the system with a personal number. Uh, but you can always look for kind of side work would be maybe my recommendation. The next question, uh, does, stu does student residency limit you to only work in Sweden? This a bit depends on where you're from. So uh, if you're from a non-EU citizen, yes, your residence permit in Sweden will allow you only to work in Sweden. So for example, if you take an internship or something in Copenhagen, that would have to be unpaid as you can't essentially make money in another EU country while your residence permit is only for Sweden. However, if you are an EU citizen, uh, then all bets are off. So as Paul said, Paul's from the Netherlands and is uh, doing part-time work in Copenhagen, then it's completely fine because, of course, EU citizens are allowed to live and work in all countries. So it a bit depends on where you're from there. Uh, and another question I would like to actually pose to everyone who, who has talked about uh, part-time work, and Alexandra, you actually started to touch on this a bit, uh, but if someone is asking, uh, for everyone who's working, do you speak Swedish, and how possible do you think it is to find a job if you're not speaking Swedish? So maybe we can talk a bit about the importance of, of that on either end. So maybe, Alexandra, since you started uh, talking about that a little bit, you could elaborate a bit more. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So uh, there are plenty of uh, of career websites where you can start searching for that, and also LinkedIn is a good way how you can look for uh, for professional opportunities. Um, a lot of jobs require Swedish language in my field, so I'm looking in in more human resource, uh, in more project management, and more in terms of uh, sustainable development. So these are three fields where where I faced that a lot of jobs, uh, especially full-time jobs, require Swedish language. However, there are still plenty of options which are great with uh, English language. And it's great if you have some, some additional language. Uh, and uh, For example, I know Ukrainian, so this is also kind of my benefit for the company because I can connect in, in other regions. Um, a lot of companies are located here in Skåne, which are international. I don't know, like IKEA, Tetra Park, um, Access. So these companies usually do not require Swedish language. But you should know that when you enter, um, I mean, job opportunity, you enter the um, your first placement, probably you will meet some Swedish people. So it's it's at least great to have um, this respect of learning language uh, in the country where you stay. So I see um, Swedish language more as a respect to the country and also as an opportunity to get more great contacts rather than, you know, um, a benefit for, for me as a candidate. Absolutely. I think that really well encompasses <laughs> kind of that situation there. But does anyone have anything they'd like to add? Otherwise, great. So I think uh, some advice that we always give uh, from our office is that, of course, it's completely possible to get by in Sweden without Swedish in terms of your studies and your everyday life. And as Alexander said, it is possible to find jobs uh, where you don't need to speak Swedish, as in, as evidenced by the fact that all of the students here today who shared about their pop-term jobs, I think all of you don't speak Swedish, right? Or at least not fluently. Correct me if I'm wrong, someone. <laughs> but, uh, but when it comes to looking for full-time work afterwards, it essentially can never hurt you to speak Swedish. It will always be a benefit. So it's something definitely that if you're really determined to stay and live in Sweden, it doesn't hurt at all. You definitely should try to learn some Swedish. At least some uh, can at least get you in the door. There will always be more opportunities available, obviously, if you speak Swedish. However, there are still options if you don't. Uh, the last question we have here in the chat uh, is more specific about master's thesis research, uh, and I'm a little bit confused quite what you mean here, but uh, it's if it's possible to do the research at another Swedish institution, even if you're not there for an internship. So I think perhaps this will vary quite a lot depending on the program you're studying. So if uh, in terms of where you can kind of do your interviews or your questionnaires for your research, um, this is probably more something that you'll want to talk to, uh, to your program coordinator with to see kind of what's an option for you depending on your topic and the department and things like that. So I don't know if anyone, yeah, a lot of nods there. I think that's really going to be quite uh, specific to, to you and what you're studying. 
But great, we've had uh, a lot of really wonderful questions here today and a lot of great things to, to share. So as we start to kind of wrap up in the last few minutes, I would love to just go around and kind of have everyone share uh, sort of your, your kind of biggest takeaway or really your biggest advice for someone who's in the audience and is considering uh, if they come to Lind, whether they want to get involved in research or internships or study abroad, what would be your biggest advice to someone who's considering doing it and what's the best reason to do so perhaps? So maybe we'll, uh, start with Prince. Uh, thank you. So if you're interested in qualitative studies or quantitative studies, and um, then I will, I will definitely say go into research, um, which is the gateway, because once you get into research, you can meet other researchers you can network with, which can help, can help you during your thesis and probably even offer you a PhD position, that is if you're into research. So I would say do that. But also, it's also important to also explore what your main topic would be or what you want to go into. Do you want to go into sexual reproductive health and rights? Are you interested in migrant health? Or maybe specifically with diabetes or cancer, or maybe even a specific cancer, or you generally about mental health. So you just decide which one you are into and probably wait for the first few weeks when you go into class and feel, feel for it. Your lecturers, guest lecturers, somebody may, might just make an impression on you. Maybe you also want to go into economic evaluation. Then you can just make the connection from there and on you go. Before you know it, you are a researcher. Thanks. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Saskia. Uh, I think like the biggest um, tip for me for looking for these kind of experiences or connections because um, I think like personal connections, personal recommendations is something that is really highly appreciated here. Absolutely. You cannot uh, underestimate networks yes. enough for sure. Thank you. Yana. I would also definitely recommend at least trying to get into the research when you're doing your master thesis or not or your master program, sorry, um, if you're at all interested. And I would advise you to just be attentive. In German, you would say, keep your ears open. Uh, so look around what might interest you. And if you hear, even if it's just a guest lecture from somebody that you're like, oh, yeah, I think this is very interesting. Just approach the people and tell them that you think this is interesting. And usually this is very much appreciated. And even if you do something and you were not really sure if you want to do research or if that's the topic you're very passionate about, it's really hard to know that. And I don't think most people don't know this <laughs> before. So even if you do an applied work or a research project, um, you might also find this is not what you want to do, but that's also very valuable information for yourself. Absolutely, for sure. Thank you. Powell. Um, if you're looking for uh, degrees and you're comparing them to different universities and you see that one of them offers the opportunity to do a study abroad as part of your curriculum, I would definitely really consider that specific degree or that university because I think it's such a valuable experience uh, that you're able to go abroad to like experience education in a different institution that you probably would never study uh, at if it wasn't for this exchange opportunity. And then I think that's so valuable. So I would definitely look into this and really consider doing it. I will say, I'm very happy that I did it. Definitely. And as someone who studied abroad during my bachelor's program as well, I can really echo that completely. It really changes everything. Wonderful. And Alexandra, we will end with you. Um, okay. So the, the, the biggest benefit, I would say, is uh, the opportunity to gain intercultural experience and also um, find really different perspectives uh, on, on topics you thought you know about, but seeing it from some other side and seeing from um, from other perspective is a great uh, uh, part as an advice. I would say that it is great to, to be open for diff different opportunities. Uh, you never know what will come to you and would it inspire you or maybe you never considered yourself for example in public health but then after a course in public health you get so much inspired of the topic so you can just um, continue you know uh, developing that field so 
um, I would suggest to see um, master programs, bachelor programs, and also this uh, practical experience as opportunity to open a part for yourselves, which you will never be able to open in any other moment. So it's just good time to experiment and to try and to explore and to enjoy like the most to enjoy this experience it's only you know half a year of your life maybe a year of your life but it can change a lot so so enjoy and try wonderful thank you so much for all that great advice and i want to say something something we somehow uh, didn't note until now but i just realized we have here among our panel every sort of different faculty or not every faculty but all different faculties so I mean we have social science science engineering business medicine so I really want to emphasize to the audience that taking advantage of these opportunities is something that you could do no matter what you're studying no matter what area even if you think oh my area is not really a traditional kind of research area it's not biology I'm not going to be in a lab you really don't never know where these kind of opportunities could take you you never know what opportunities there are to go abroad to study and to really take advantage so uh, as we wind down now, I want to say thank you so much to our panel uh, for sharing from your experiences today, sharing all of your insights and advice. Hopefully it's been, I know, very enlightening just for me. So I think really wonderful for our audience to hear as well. Especially big thank you to Paul. I know it's quite late now in Hong Kong. So thank you for joining us. Uh, and I also want to thank our audience, of course, for sticking around and for giving us such great questions to answer. Before I let everyone go, I want to call your attention to a few last links in the chat where you can kind of get some more information. So I've posted the link here to jobs and internships page where you can read a bit more about uh, that particularly if you're interested. Of course we have a few more sessions left in our applicant weeks so in about half an hour uh, you can join me with several of our LU alumni if you would like to hear kind of the next step from a lot of the jobs and internship talk that we talked about today. Uh, the folks who actually have gone on to have really successful careers we'll be talking to them in half an hour and tomorrow we will have our final day where we have uh, really in-depth sessions about how to apply both at the bachelor's level and at the master's level. Uh, so if you have questions about the application, please join us there. If you're not able to join us tomorrow, the next link is contact us. That's where you can get in touch with my office, so the recruitment office, where we can help answer any of those application questions, or I know a couple of the questions that we weren't able to get to today, please reach out to us there. Uh, of course, we have the uh, link for where you can learn how to apply and the application steps. But finally, the final link chat with students is where you can actually contact uh, all five of the students who are here today. If anyone said anything that really triggers a question later and you think, oh, I wish I had asked them that, you still have that opportunity. So feel free Free to go there and you can message them directly along with around 75 other students and recent alumni uh, from all over the world from all different programs so really utilize that resource to to get in touch and ask your questions directly to our students but otherwise i wish everyone a really wonderful day thank you so much for being with us and i hope the rest of your day or your evening is just as enjoyable <laughs>